And so as we think a little bit about um, where all that biomass actually comes from, it's often a good idea for us to think about our own biomass and where our biomass comes from. Um, because we know that if we consider an American 10-year-old child, it weighs about 70 pounds. Um, and if you think about yourself, um, my guess is, is as an adult, you probably don't still weigh 70 pounds. And so the real question is, where did all of that biomass or that weight actually come from? And so the list that students often um, come up with is here, one through five. And we can kind of go through each one of these and kind of understand which ones are right and which ones aren't. Um, so the first option is air. We know that it's not as though you, if you breathe heavier, that you're actually going to get heavier. So that's not really the case. Um, number two, we don't really have roots like plants do. So it's not as though we could take up any soil um, like Mike's plants did and be able to gain biomass that way. So that's not really how we get heavier. Um, water, we know that water can impact our weight. Um, we can cause some, some small or minimal fluctuations um, in weight by having more or less water, but it's not as though if we are completely dehydrated that we were actually kind of re resort back to the size that we are when we were actually born. So that's really not a good explanation for our, our biomass. Um, and of course you may love sun, like number four, um, but that's certainly not gonna be um, effective at helping you grow. And so that kind of leads us to the last option, which is indeed food, the food we eat, and that is exactly how we get bigger. And so that leads us to kind of a sidelight, um, thinking a little bit about um, how organisms get their energy. And so we can take all organisms on Earth and kind of put them into two separate categories. And the first category are what are called heterotrophs. And as you've already learned from um, other things in this class, hetero literally means different. Um, and troph actually refers to nourish or nutrition. And so organisms that are heterotrophic get their nutrition from something else. They have to eat something else. And that includes um, anything like animals or fungi and many different types of bacteria. Um, and you are a heterotroph. And that then kind of leads the other category. Everything else um, is what's considered to be an autotroph. And auto literally means self. And so these are the self feeders. So they are able to provide the nutrition that they need through their own means. And in most cases, it's through the process of photosynthesis. So they're actually making their own sugars, whereas heterotrophs have to consume other things that have made sugars for them or gotten sugars themselves. And so as we kind of think back then to um, that difference between the willow shoot and the willow tree that we saw from Van Helmont's example, we can kind of think a little bit about another example of a plant and think about an acorn and say this acorn that we see kind of in the lower left hand corner here, um, it's really, really small. But of course, over time, it grows into this very, very, very large tree. And clearly it's increasing significantly in terms of its biomass. So where does the majority of its biomass come from if we go through this nice long list? Well, we can kind of go through them individually again and think about where it is they come from. And this, in this case, we'll talk about it from the bottom up. So number five is food. And so those are the sugars. Well, as we already mentioned, um, an acorn or a plant is a autotroph, so they're actually getting all of their own energy themselves. They're making it through photosynthesis. So clearly that's not, um, they don't get energy from um, an external source as food. Um, if we talk about sun, uh, as we already mentioned, sun provides the necessary energy to be able to make this, but it does not actually contribute to the mass itself. Um, just like in us, water can create um, fluctuations, small fluctuations in terms of biomass, but it is clearly not the primary contributor to this very, very large tree that we're seeing, this oak tree down here. Um, soil, this again was, was one of the ideas that Mike had, and we, we kind of have this idea that, that, that nutrients can be an important factor and they can actually increase growth, but it's, it's certainly not the major driver. And so that leaves us with the last choice, which of course is air. And specifically, as we mentioned, it has to be a carbon-based molecule, so it is indeed carbon dioxide. So now we've kind of identified, um, these are kind of three main things that may be also helping for plants to grow. And we can kind of think of those in the process um, of plants getting their own energy through this process of photosynthesis. And so as we think of photosynthesis as a process, all processes have inputs and they also have outputs, things that go into them and then things that come out of these processes. So we can identify which of these pieces go in and which of these pieces come out. So first and foremost, we already identified carbon dioxide is in the air and that's one of the key things that goes into the process of photosynthesis. Um, in addition, water, as we already mentioned, is clearly needed. If without water, you cannot have a plants grow. 
Um, they cannot do photosynthesis without it, so it is also an input. Um, in addition, um, sun, that energy that's from the sun is needed to kind of help kickstart, um, provides the energy to, to allow this process to go forward. And as we think about what things we get out of the process of photosynthesis, um, as we mentioned, air is comprised of many different things. And one of the things that's also included is oxygen. And that is actually one of the outputs. And it's actually just a byproduct um, of this whole process. But it is indeed an output that we're very glad for. And then, of course, another very important piece is the food or the sugars that come out of this process. And so if you put all these pieces together, you can kind of think about an equation for the process of photosynthesis. And it hopefully looks a little bit like this. And that is that the left side um, of the arrow, you have all your inputs like carbon dioxide and water. And of course, you need light to kind of kickstart the reaction. And then what comes out, the outputs on the right hand side are things like sugar and oxygen. And so this is um, uh, a kind of oversimplification of a very kind of complex process of um, photosynthesis that we're going to be talking a little bit more extensively about, but this gets us on the right page. And so before we talk a little bit in, any more about this, I wanted to kind of remember that, that all of these reactions, all of these things that are going on are occurring at a cellular level. And we've already learned a little bit about cells, so we can kind of think back to what's in a cell and specifically what, what occurs in a cell that's important for this process is a chloroplast. And chloroplasts are just the specialized organelle that functions in doing photosynthesis. And depending on the type of organism, the type of cell, you can actually have one chloroplast in, within one cell, or in some cases you can have up to 100 chloroplasts within a single cell. Um, and of course, these are only in autotrophic cells, not in heterotrophic cells. And so as we kind of think a little bit about specifically what a chloroplast looks like, we can see this image down here. And we know that, of course, we have these first two membranes that are on the outside of that. And then directly on the inside is this kind of space called the stroma. And then floating or kind of embedded within the stroma are these little structures called thylakoids. And thylakoids you can kind of think of as this membrane-bound compartment. So yes, they are indeed enclosed in yet another membrane. Um, and those are all within the chloroplast. And so photosynthesis is really occurring kind of within these spaces, um, within the thylakoids and within the stroma, as well as on all of these different membranes. And so next what I'd like to have you do is, is, is watch this, um, this video, and it talks a little bit more detail about this process, talks about the kind of key um, enzymes and, and, and other factors that kind of happen and where things happen. And so um, as you watch this, um, be sure to build a model of the process of photosynthesis, um, which is kind of a detailed illustration. It talks specifically about the inputs and the outputs. It talks about kind of where things are, what are the kind of key players in this process. And you're going to need that for the apply portion of this topic. So go ahead and watch that video.